EMCI and EMC. My name is Belinda Stashukevich and I'm the editor of Interference Technology. Established in 1970, Interference Technology helps EMI and EMC engineers find solutions to their various testing, design, application, and regulatory issues by publishing articles, news, and other practical content. This webinar is presented by Keith Armstrong. Keith graduated from Imperial College London in 1972 with a Bachelor of Science in Electrical Engineering, specializing in analog circuit design and electromagnetic field theory. He formed Cherry Club Consultants Limited in 1990, which provides design services to help achieve compliance with EMC. They currently have nearly 800 satisfied customers in almost all areas where electronics are used. This webinar is one of many that Keith has done for interference technology. To view his others, please visit our website, interferencetechnology.com, and click on the Webinars tab. This webinar will be interactive. You will be able to ask questions and answer polls, and we encourage you to participate. Take a look at your GoToWebinar navigation pane, the box on the right-hand corner of your screen. If at any time you have a question, we ask you to fill out the type box and hit Send. To make the screen minimize and maximize, click the arrow button. To raise your hand to ask a question or to report an issue, click the hand icon. We'll present the topic for 45 minutes, followed by a 15-minute question and answer session. Now Keith will begin the presentation. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, can you see my screen yet? Yes, everything looks good, Keith. You're oh, all good. good. Great. Uh, you see a button pops up. I didn't see it this time. Anyway, welcome everybody. Um, this is me. That picture is of me looking particularly smart. Uh, I don't normally look that smart. So, um, let's get on with the material. HDI, High Density Interconnect, that's the proper name for what we tend to call microvia board technology. And um, it's, it's also, uh, t in the past anyway, was called sequential build-up technology or simply build-up because what happens is that the, the printed circuit board layers are um, uh, etched and drilled and plated and then stacked together to make the PCB, unlike a through-hole plate where uh, the layers are etched and stacked and glued together and then drilled so that the, the holes go all the way through. And we call that through hole plate. The other thing is that microvires are not drilled with, with metal drills or punches. They're, they're usually drilled with lasers. And uh, they can be very small. They can be six thousandths of an inch. That's what in Britain we say thou. About 150 microns uh, diameter or smaller. And so you can get a lot more pins per unit area than you can with through hole plate. And the microvires only connect between the necessary board layers. So they don't constrain the routing in other layers. Uh, this means they can significantly reduce the number of board layers you need, uh, especially according to Mentor Graphics anyway, where through hole plate would require 10 or more layers. So this is the original a uh, microvire technology that was introduced some years ago. We've got a, a core of FR4 and some pure polymer build-up layers. This is one of the advantages of microvire is that they, they don't use fiberglass, they just use pure polymer, which is a better material, but it's also more expensive. So there's some tracks on the various layers. And you see we can have a, a vire that's drilled all the way through after the lamination. We've got a vire that's been drilled um, in the FR4 there might be many layers in the FR4 uh, before the microvirus were put on top. Microvirus layers were put on top. Now, hi everyone. Sorry, I think we're having a little bit of technical difficulties. Keith might be having some issues with his internet, so if everybody just holds tight, and we'll try to get him back. We can see Keith's working on getting back. I think he's just having some audio issues, so if everybody can just hold on. 
Oh, wait a minute. There we go. That's better, isn't it? Great. We can hear you now. Yeah. Sorry. I, um, I pressed a button on my microphone that I shouldn't have done. <laughs> Sorry about that. I told you we could always make mistakes. So, blind bias, where do we get to? Um, blind bias, did we get that far? Hello? No. Oh, well. Blind bias are on outer layers and they go down to the next layer down. And you can have buried bias, we can have buried bias that go down on internal layers. If you want to connect from layer one to layer three, say, you have to go down to layer two and then across a bit with a trace or, or another bias onto layer three. So there's a good example of going on from the bottom layer onto uh, two layers down. So that was your traditional HDI technology, but modern microvire technology has uh, uh, stacked vires like this. The vires, you can put them on top of each other. <clears throat> so there's, a, there's the ordinary uh, technology, and there's the, the more modern technology. Here we've got a stack wire going layers one to three, and here's some going between layers 14 and 16. So, uh, as I said, microvires are closed at one end, so they don't steal solder during reflow, which means you can have wire in pad layouts. And this is good for EMC, because one of the problems is uh, power supply decoupling suffers from the inductance of the, um, uh, the pin escape traces or the lead out. Uh, breakout traces. Having viridin pad reduces that and so makes the decoupling better because um, you may remember from an earlier webinar, above a few hundred megahertz, uh, we do our decoupling, our power supply decoupling with inductance, basically with the, the pad pattern of the printed circuit board rather than with the capacitor. Now, there is a problem though. If you just have um, blind microvires and they're not completely covered with a, a, a flat surface, then when you print solder paste over them, you get the layer bubbles trapped. And when you put them through the reflow oven, um, they can expand and, and pop, and you sometimes get, they sometimes call it popcorning, but you might get a, a bad solder joint because of this air bubble bursting out. So uh, you need to watch out for that. Microvires are used to make the smallest, lightest, and least power hungry products. So you can find them in a, a wide variety of mass produced products, including even some toys. And they're inherently more robust than through whole plate because the, the microvires themselves are smaller and more rugged. So I've read that the, the military prefer them in some high re reliability or harsh environments because they don't fail as often as a, a long through whole plate, especially if you've got a, a, a very thick board. Then a, you know, if you've got a very thick board, say it's three millimeters thick, and you've got a half millimeter drilled wire through it, then the aspect ratio is uh, is enormous. It's you know, what would it be? Six to one, and they can be as high as fourteen to one. So it's basically a long, thin metal tube, and very um, liable to break. And the last uh, webinar I did was about um, ball grid arrays, and here's a ball grid array on a through hole board showing the dog bones that we use to connect to the um, through holes. There's the pad that the device gets soldered onto, and then there's the through hole that connects the signal or power into an inner layer. Uh, you can get rid of the dog bones with using um, capped wires. Here's an example of a board. This is a through hole board, but all the wire holes are capped with copper and smooth. So these have got regular wire holes underneath them. In that, in that particular example, the wire holes would be quite large. If you've got a microvire board though, um, here's an array of, of pads with wire in pad, but the microvires themselves are so small that they, they don't have to go in the middle of the pad. You can move them around. So for instance here, these microvires have been pushed to one side of the pad and these to the other side of the pad so that we can get a, a wider trace through on an inner layer. With a through hole, you'd be restri rather restricted in the trace width and here we can get a wider trace through. So you can move them around wherever within the pad. Here's an example of a Vertex 7 um, FP uh, field programmable gate array. And here's uh, one of their advertising pictures. They're very proud of it because it's got 
so many billion transistors, and it's actually a 3D stacked wafer, one of the first 3D stacked wafers. But what I'm interested in here is, um, you can see this pattern of pads underneath here, these are all microvires. These, this board substrate is a, um, a microvire substrate. And uh, I don't know what pitch these balls are on, but they're very, very small. So aligning the chip must be quite, um, uh, must be quite precise. But look at all the pins, um, all the connections that go through onto the printed circuit board. With uh, orbit arrays, the, uh, their power integrity and signal integrity suffers from the perforation of the uh, planes, the not one power planes underneath them. The best we can do is to use um, appropriate track and gap layout rules to try and get a mesh or a grid over the area covered by the solder pads. So we, we did this in the last webinar. Um, here's some examples. I could have used these last time, but I didn't. This is a six layer board, and you can see that uh, in this particular layout, on the ground plane and the power plane, the, we haven't got a mesh. We've got great big holes uh, banged in. Now, this is very bad. The, the place where you want the most solid planes is right underneath the devices. And then with this kind of board grid array, uh, that's the one place where you can't have solid planes. Here's another example. Now, this is a better meshing. This is from the same reference. And you can see here that we've got a mesh. Uh, the wire hole is still pretty big, so it's like a matrix of plane, but that's much better than having a big hole. There's the power plane. But the thing with uh, microvire planes is that they aren't perforated, at least they aren't necessarily perforated. With a through-hole plate, any time you change a layer, you get a through-hole that goes all the way through the board, through all the layers, including the planes, whether you want to or not. But um, with a HDI, we can create solid more volt power plane pairs under the ball grid arrays, which have lower series inductances because they're more solid, higher mutual inductances, and higher capacitance, which improves decoupling. So that improves power integrity and EMC. And also, the less perforation in the uh, return path inductance in the naught volt plane gives us better signal integrity and EMC. Where you have microvires that perforate a plane, the gaps, say, they make it very small because they're, they're very small um, holes, you know. So the effects are much smaller than they would be with through a whole plate. In fact, they had to invent microwires for cell phones. When they started making cell phones, or trying to make cell phones, they found that putting a 2 watt 900 megahertz transmitter on the same little printed circuit board with a microprocessor and a microphone amplifier, amongst other things, um, they couldn't keep the noise um, from the, one of the areas, like the RF noise, out of the uh, digital. They couldn't keep the digital noise out of the analog. And because they had lots of little components and there were through holes throughout, and so the, the Norwell plane just looked like a colander, just like a mesh, and it wasn't very good. So they invented microvires specifically for cell phones just to get a solid Norwell plane. And then uh, the, rest, the, the rest is history, of course, because the cell phones work very well. Additional benefits from microvire include um, wiring pads, I mentioned before, reduces decoupling inductances. So the resonances in the power distribution network are pushed to higher frequencies, where there's hopefully less energy to excite them. The shorter traces that you can use become um, efficient accidental antennas at higher frequencies. So once again, we, we try and push everything to higher frequencies, where hopefully uh, we don't care anymore. Smaller printed circuit boards become um, efficient as accidental patch antennas at higher frequencies again. They, if you have a shorter trace, you might not need to match it and treat it like a matched transmission line. So that saves a bit of uh, layout effort. And the, the main thing, the, the less perforated naught volt and power planes, then give us an improved image plane effect, which is a shielding effect. So we get a higher shielding effectiveness, even without any tin cans. Time for some poll questions. Okay. We have some questions on microvia PCB technology. Can it reduce the number of layers? Yes or no? We'll give you a few seconds to answer. And 
And most everybody said yes, which was correct. We'll go to the next one. Do microvias steal so solder? Excuse me. Yes or no? And we have answers come in. And almost everybody said no, which is correct. Here's another one. Are solid planes under ICs good for PI? Yes or no? We have more votes coming in. And pretty much everybody said yes, which is correct. And one more. Can microvias now be stacked vertically? Yes or no? We have some votes coming in. And 100% of everybody said yes, which is correct. Back to you, Keith. Thanks, Belinda. Um, okay. So one of the advantages of microbiome board technology is that we can use the very small uh, IC packages and get benefits. So we've got miniature or micro ball grid array, especially with very small ball pitches. And I've seen uh, design PCB design guidelines for a quarter millimeter ball pitches, which is quite quite extreme. Um, but we've seen that, that the problem with through hole plate is that we get a, per, a heavily perforated plane, and with with microvia we don't. But there's other techniques. There's direct chip attach, there's uh, flip chip, chip scale packaging, and tape automated bonding. Now these basically use almost the naked silicon in a sort of rudimentary packaging, and um, we don't have the inductance of the lead frames and the bond wires to act as a filter. So if we're not careful, if we use these, these very small uh, silicon uh, devices, the, uh, the noise we get is, is horrendous. And I remember a, a guy who was making a hearing aid telling me once, he'd got a one kilohertz clocked microprocessor in this hearing aid, and it was to fit in an ear canal with the battery and the speakers and everything, so it's very tiny. It's printed circuit was very tiny. He's, made, he's using a naked silicon chip on the printed circuit board. And even though he's clocking at one kilohertz, he was failing the emissions tests at 10 meters, uh, every harmonic of one kilohertz to over a gigahertz. So he's failing his emissions tests at a one millionth harmonic. So that's the sort of fate that lies in store for us if we try and use these very small um, chip packages on through-hole plate boards. But on microvia boards, because they're very small and very thin, um, and if we put a 0 volt plane uh, in on layer one or layer two, then we get a very powerful image plane effect, and so the, we get much more effective shielding, uh, which helps uh, us to use them to get their benefits. Now I said this already, so uh, when we don't have the the bond wires and the lead frames that we get in the big packages, the the internal switching speeds leak out into the PCB structure, unless we use microvia techniques. And also, good EMC design techniques. It's not just enough to use microvia, we have to use some other good EMC design techniques. Um, in May 2000, the Institute of Printed Circuits found there were 62 manufacturers of um, microvia boards worldwide. In May 2008, just eight years later, and six years ago now, there were um, quite a lot of manufacturers in the UK. Now the UK isn't a hotbed of electronic um, activity these days, uh, which is a pity, but there you go. Um, but even so, we had all these uh, microbiome manufacturers just in the UK, when eight years before there, there were not many more around the whole world. The, it used to be the case that the microbiome board manufacturers uh, use different techniques because they basically made their own machines. So uh, you might need to use different layout techniques depending on which manufacturer you're using. So you should always ask about the design rules before you start the board layout. Choose your supplier and ask them if they have any design rules. The basic standard for microvirus is IPC 2315. And the original uh, microvirus technology made some good EMC board design techniques in practical. For instance, uh, it's a good practice to put a 0 volt power plane pair to give us a distributed embedded capacitance. 
uh, on the, the next layers down from the top and bottom side, so layers two and three, for instance. But uh, with the original microwire technology, you couldn't do that. We had to put them further down in the stack up, so that wasn't so wonderful. But modern microwire techniques allow us to do that. So we're back, back on course again. People are often complain to me that they say, oh, I can't use microwires, they're too expensive. But the IPC found in 2000 that if they shopped around, they could get microwire boards for the same price as through-hole plate boards. And if you don't use buried wires, you can reduce the costs even more. So they could be cheaper than through-hole plate. And as I said on, on the first slide, the latest advice, well, I say latest advice, it's from about five years ago, from Mentor Graphics, that if your through-hole plate boards need more than eight to ten layers, uh, they should cost less if you use HDI, microwire, because you need fewer layers. So although the layers themselves might be more expensive, perhaps, um, you need fewer of them, so you save money overall. They reckon an 18-layer through-hole plate board would only need ten layers in microwire. And those of us who've done uh, very large layer count boards know once you get past about 10 layers or 12 layers, um, because of the blocked routing caused by all the through, hole, the through holes poking through, every layer you add doesn't really give you a lot of benefit in routing. So once you get beyond 12 layers, you pretty soon get up to 18 and 20 layers. Um, but with microvires, um, every new microvire layer has complete routing on it. So it's much more effective through a whole plane. And, and anyway, focusing on the, the bomb cost, the bill of materials cost, uh, is, is incorrect. It's a common management mistake. Uh, it's our fault as engineers for letting our managers make this mistake because we need to educate them better. What really matters is the overall cost of manufacture. But that's often a bit hard to pinpoint, whereas adding up the list of the, uh, of the cost of the components is easy to do. And so, because it's easy, people tend to focus on it. But it's actually uh, an incorrect thing to do. And I, uh, I wrote an article on that if anybody's interested. Let's look at some mi modern microbiotic technologies. These ones are from Via Systems. And here they've cross-sectioned the board. You can see they've got stacked microbiotic going all the way through a board there. Here's a close-up of one of their special microbiotic. They call it a deep microbiotic. I think it's going down through two layers. And there's a deep stacked microbiotic. Now, they, these two, two types, via systems, say that they uh, give a planar surface for via for in pad. But it looks to me like these have a planar surface too, so I don't really understand that. And they have improved current capacity and thermal management. Well, inevitably, because as you can see, they're solid copper. They aren't a layer of copper on the edges of a hole now. They're actually solid copper, so they're really rugged and, and uh, you know, really very uh, marvelous little tiny vials. I'm going to quote a lot from this, um, uh, this document here, HDA, HDI layer stackups for large dense PCBs. It's written by Happy Holden and Charles Pfeiffer, and it's published by Mental Graphics in July 2007. And you can get it easily off the internet if you just uh, search for it by Google. It's a, an excellent paper, um, and has lots and lots of useful detail in it. So <clears throat> here's, for instance, one of the drawings from that document. And it's showing uh, modern via techniques. There's a stacked microvire, and there's a, what is called a skip via, which via system is called a deep, a deep via. This, this is a, a microvire going through two layers, see? So you can stack them up like this, or you can have one that goes all the way through. So these techniques are considered to be more costly. And these ones are the old microbiome technology, which is less costly. It seems that the IPC have been trying to standardize on, on microbiome construction, basically, I think, so that you can do a particular kind of design and then shop around, and then shop around to find people who can make it, rather than having to do what I said before, which is to um, check with your manufacturer you know, what his design rules are. This is called an IPC Type 1, and it has at least one layer of microvia stacked on top of a bunch of FR4 layers. And this one's got a, one layer of microvia 
on both sides, as you can see. Um, but there's no buried through-hole plate fires in this. All the, all the through-hole plate fires go all the way through. Here's an IPC Type 2, which comes in three flavors. Uh, there's the basic one, and you can see we can have buried through-hole plate in it. And I think that, that indicates that it's filled with resin. Um, there's a Type 2 with variable depth microbias, in other words, skip, skip microbias. And here's an IPC Type 3 with stacked microbias. And interestingly, they've shown this drawing here. It's still um, one layer of uh, uh, buildup, one layer of microbial buildup outside of an FR4 core. But you see here we've got a, a buried through hole in the, in the FR4, which has been capped and had a microbial stacked on top of it. Obviously, we can stack the microbials on top of each other, but for some reason, it's not shown on this drawing. So there's some uh, material about it. And here's a type 3, IPC type 3. This has at least two build-up layers on at least one side. These examples have got two layers on, on both sides. This is an FR4 stack, which could have any number of layers in it, in here. And these are the build-up layers. And there's the basic IPC type 2, which, which doesn't have stacked fires. And there's the IPC type 3 with stacked fires. And also, of course, you could have skip skip microvires as well, which go through two layers. Then there's uh, IPC type 4 and type 5 and so on. So types 1, 2, and 3 use a, a, an FR4 core with the polymer buildup layers. And the idea is to keep the cost low. The problem here is that different materials have different temperature coefficients and different rates of moisture absorbance. FR4, for instance, absorbs quite a lot of moisture and swells in a high, you know, swells quite a bit in a high humidity environment. So an important issue with these constructions is uh, that they don't delaminate. If you've got a particular uh, environment with lots of temperature cycling or lots of humidity cycling, um, then uh, that puts quite a bit of stress on the glue between the layers. So what I would do, what I'd recommend there, is make, make sure that your board manufacturer can demonstrate that for your kind of physical environment, a climatic environment, that the, the boards won't come unstuck over the expected lifetime. Of course, if you're using the same material for every layer, if you're using pure polymer you know, uh, on every layer, then you don't get the problems. Some people say, in fact, it's Happy Holden uh, says, quote, IPC types 4, 5, and 6 are more costly and probably not necessary for large, dense printed circuit boards with BGA breakout and routing challenges. Okay, so here's a, an, an IPC type 3. This is another, picture, uh, another graphic from this uh, excellent document. Um, two build-up layers outside of, however many is it, um, 12, 12 layers of FR4. Notice, he says this is a good stack up for power integrity in the MC. Notice he puts a ground layer on the outside. Now, you, you, you can't do this with through hole plate because the ground plane would be too heavily perforated to be of any use. But here we put a ground plane on the outer layer and then a power layer, VCC layer, uh, underneath. This is a, an advantage of microbiota that we'll come back to in a minute. He's also got this picture here. This is, must be a, an IPC type type 4 or 5 with 3, which he said earlier wasn't necessary, but he's got 3 layers of build-up on each side. And you see it goes uh, ground and VCC, then a couple of signal layers, and the other side ground, VCC, and a couple of signal layers, uh, with a symmetrical stack up to uh, stop the board warping when you put it through the, the reflow solder machine. There's a number of, of uh, drawings like this in the document, with these like uh, little speedometer gauges showing you uh, cost, routing density, power integrity, signal integrity. Um, and here's another example of, um, it, it must be a, an IPC type 4 or 5 again, because there's three build-up layers on top of the FR4 stack. 
and he reckons it's uh, not very expensive, it has high routing density, has very good power integrity and very good signal integrity, which means it has very good EMC. Now, this is uh, with classical old-fashioned um, microwire techniques with buried and blind wires. There are no stack wires in there, though there is an internal uh, through-hole plate in the FR4 stack. Now, when you have top and bottom layers as uh, zero volts or ground planes, it helps to shield all the internal traces. If you put a perimeter guard trace and a via wall on the board or an edge plating and use low-cost board level shielding, you can make fully shielded board assemblies. And there's more details about that in my, in my PCB book with the references at the end. Typically, uh, a ball grid array has 30% or more of its pins as naught volts, and perhaps as many of those rest being power. So, uh, we still have two-thirds of the BGA pins, on average, penetrating the, the ground plane on the outside. But the thing is, as I said before, the, the anti-pads, the holes where the microvirus go through, are very small, so it doesn't perforate the plane very much. And when you put power and ground planes on adjacent layers immediately below the um, integrated circuit, we get the, an embedded decoupling capacitance, which is the best for power integrity and also the best for EMC. And these stack-ups then benefit the, uh, when you've got uh, ground and power planes in outer layers. You, you need to use stacked microvires or skip microvires to connect the signals onto the internal routing layers. We can reduce the, the board size and the product weight and size and the overall manufacturing costs even further by using another technique which is embedded components. We can have embedded pull-up and termination resistors and that's done with uh, nichrome metal layers which are etched to give us the resistor values inside the printed circuit board. Now that effectively means you've got a shielded uh, termination resistor for your, for your uh, transmission lines, which is better than having a resistor stuck on the outside of the board. We can embed surge and transient protection in a, a layer in, inside the board, a special layer of, of dielectric, so we don't have to have surge and transient protection as components on the outer layers of the board. We can have embedded integrated circuits. Now, we all of us carry around several of these in our smart cards. Um, they have embedded integrated circuits. And do you remember the old ones, the very first ones, you could always feel a bump where the, where the chip was embedded in the, board, in the plastic. And nowadays you can't feel them because they make, they make them skinnier. Of course, you can't get powerful, very powerful ICs like, like that Vertex 7 I was showing earlier. You can't get that as an embedded component. It's always going to be, so that the high performance ones are always going to have to be on the outside of the, of the board. But if you just want sort of like 80, 8051 functionality, you know, 8-bit micro functionality, um, I think even 16-bit, you can basically get the micros as really skinny versions which will go inside the board laminations. We can have embedded decoupling capacitors, um, you're at to do a range of embedded ones, and um, they're 0.15 millimeters thick, so that's like a typical, a typical board, you know, um, plane spacing, so we can have the capacitors embedded in the board without making any bumps. And we can also have embedded high capacitance laminates like um, Farad Flex and ECM and all these sorts of things. I think we talked about before, didn't we? Um, ideally, we make them less than 50 microns thick. Uh, you can get Farad Flex layers down to 8 microns thick and um, ECM layers down to three microns thick. It's very, uh, very thin indeed, and certainly with the Farad Flex, the Farad Flex people say that uh, they can, ordinary board manufacturers can handle their very thin layers without any special precautions. But I think if you go down to the three micron one from ECM, then you, you, you have to have the ability to use these very thin laminates, um, which are a bit like a very fine fabric really and can easily wrinkle, which of course would be no good at all. When you get down to the very thin embedded high capacitance laminates, you get a huge capacitance uh, per square centimeter, and 
it means you can eliminate all the soldered D-cups, you know, multi-layer ceramics, except for maybe some large electrolytics like 10 microfarads or more. So you can save board area uh, and save components and get a better yield just by embedding one of these high capacitance laminates. Or probably two to have a, st uh, a symmetrical stack up. Now here's an example of a, a construction which um, was suggested by, um, I'm going to pronounce his name badly, I'm sorry, I apologize in advance, Lodi de Katmaka yeah, from Belgium. I'm sorry for mangling his name. Uh, what he's planning to do, he hadn't done it yet when I spoke to him, is to have an embedded high capacitance layer between the ground and power planes. Now the ground planes on the outer layer and the power planes on the next layer down. And there's a Faraflex layer or something in there. Then here's a microvire dielectric, then there's a stack up of uh, FR4, and then the same on the other side. So we could have um, through holes going all the way through. And here are some skip wires. The um, the naught volt balls on the PGA connect directly to the ground plane, so there's no extra inductance associated with the micro with a, a via hole. The power pins have to go through one little micro wire. If we use if this is a very thin layer, say maybe 12 microns thick or something, then this via hole is really very small. <coughs> and as I said before, uh, decoupling at frequencies above about 300 megahertz is actually done with the inductance of the board and the capacitors. And here what we've done, by getting rid of almost all of the, the fire hole inductance, we've made a very, very good, um, provided very, very good decoupling to, to you know, tens of gigahertz for the uh, chip. Obviously, signal pins now have to go through two layers before they can be routed around the board. And here they're using skip wires. You could obviously use stack wires instead. The, in this drawing, I've exaggerated the sizes of the microvires. Uh, in fact, they're much smaller than this, much smaller than a, one of the signal balls. So the perforations in the, in the ground plane, which look pretty horrible at this, at this scale, uh, would be really tiny. So our normal planes and outer layers are connected together with through-hole plates because we want to prevent cavity resonances inside the board. Um, there's a power plane it's creating a embedded decoupling capacitor, and there's the skip wires, like I said, connecting to the inner layers where you can do the routing. Of course, this is looks like a 10-layer FR4 stack up, so uh, you might use microvire layers in here to make the board skinnier and reduce the number of layers and perhaps even save cost overall. If we're using chip scale packages, then yeah, there's the ball grid array and these great big solder balls on, underneath. If it's a chip scale package, it's going to be much closer to the board and the solder balls will be much smaller. So, like I said before, uh, being much closer to the north pole plane, the ground plane, means you get a much stronger image plane effect, which is what we need, and also we get better decoupling, uh, what we need to be able to use the chip scale packages without causing lots of problems. That's the end. And um, there's, some, there's some slides later on with lots of references in, which people might be interested in. And to see those slides, you'll have to download the webinar off, off of the Interference Technology website. I'm not going to go through them because it's boring just showing you lists of references. Belinda has some poll questions now, and then yep. we're into our Q&A session. Yep. Some more questions on microvia PCB technology. Do chip scale ICs benefit from microvias? Yes or no? We have some answers coming in. And everybody said yes, which is correct. We'll go to the next one. Is microvia technology generally used alone? Yes or no? We have answers coming in. Everyone's doing very well. 100% said no, which is correct. And we have one more. Which layers are best for zero volt ground planes? Outer, the top one, or bottom component side? Oh, I think I may have actually. I think they're both the answer. I think we, think we messed that one up a bit. But um, both, everybody picked both, so we're good. <laughs> 
Um, we'd like to have a call for final questions. Please enter any last questions you may have in the navigation pane. We received quite a few inquiries on where to get additional information on this topic. There's a vast amount of content found on our website and Keith's website, cherryclough.com. You can also email us at info at interferencetechnology.com with specific needs and we can direct you accordingly. Keith, here's a question for you. Why not use microvia techniques for all layers in a PCB? Well, you could. Um, I think people don't tend to do it. Um, and Happy Holden, uh, for instance, uh, doesn't think it's necessary in a lot of cases uh, because they're trying to save money. Now, fair enough. I said earlier on that the bomb cost, the bit of materials cost, is not um, terribly important. But once, you, once you've dealt with everything else, it still helps to save a bit of a bit of cash on the components. So uh, that's why people try and use embedded FR4 layers. But there is the problem of delamination, and in particularly aggressive environments, you may not be able to use that, that sort of technique anyway. So you might have to go for microvia layers throughout. Okay. My company's buyer says that adding microvia layers increases the board cost. Well, uh, sorry to say, your buyer is being lazy. Um, if you're a company buyer, you know, and, and you're buying printed circuit boards from people, there's all sorts of issues of, of quality and, you know, contracts and all the rest of it. And there's quite a, a load of hoops to jump through to, to be able to use uh, a board manufacturer, you know, and feel confident. So when you've used a board manufacturer for a few years and you got used to them and you know who to ring if you get problems and you all the rest of it, you, you really don't want to change. So if some designer says, oh, how much do I microvise? You're going to ask the same guy, you know, and he's going to say, uh, oh, it's going to add to the cost because he isn't, because you got you chose a company which gave you the, the lowest price for your six or eight or ten layer through whole plate board, it's probably not going to give you the lowest cost for a microvia board. You have to go to a different supplier, somebody who specializes in microvia boards. Um, it, it's, it's not commonly known that, that the, the big board manufacturers have entire factories for doing single layer boards, different factories for two layer boards, different factories for four layer boards, and different factories for six and eight layer boards and so on. And um, if you're getting the best price, you're working with somebody who's giving you the best price on a six layer board, he's probably not going to give you the best price on an eight layer board. So if you want to go from six to eight layers, a typical um, uh, buyer will say, oh, well, it doubles the price to go from six to eight layers. But if you shop around, uh, the bare board price shouldn't be any more than about 20% more for eight layers than it would be for six layers. But you've got to shop around. Now, the IPC, the Institute of Printed Circuits found, when they shopped around in 2000, that they could get microvia boards for the same price as through whole plate. So that's the problem, is you've got to make your company buyer uh, actually do his, do his proper job and hunt around for a uh, cost-effective microvia board supplier. And then you'll find that um, it doesn't cost any more. Great. Can split, zero volt, or ground planes be used with microvia PCB technology? Well, yes, uh, uh, they can. But the, um, it's no different from through hole plate in that respect. But split, not volt, or ground planes is a bad idea anyway. I'm always having this discussion with people. Um, in the good old days, when we weren't making uh, lots of noise with our microprocessors up around eight to 900 megahertz, for instance, the, you could split naught volt planes and it wasn't so much of a problem. But really a split naught volt plane is like uh, a two wrongs make a right. Um, you know, you don't know how to control the circulating currents in the planes and so you put a big split in. And that sort of deals with the problem. But the trouble with the split is that you create a resonance structure inside the printed circuit board. And with the high levels of high frequency noise our chips are making these days, you tend to excite those resonances and get all sorts of nasty problems. One of the advantages of having a solid zero volt plane, we always split uh, power planes up, but one of the advantages of a solid 0 volt plane is it gives you lots of signal integrity benefits too. 
even in analog circuits, which don't use any uh, mic uh, any uh, digital components, it's it's better not to split planes. I learned not to split planes in 1981, and I haven't split a plane since, except for galvanic isolation. When you have galvanic isolation, you have to split a plane because you know having to go away from a good EMC technique, which is a solid plane, it warns you that you might have EMC problems, and you often do when you have a, a galvanic isolated plane. That is, you often do have EMC problems. So at least you get a bit of a warning about that. Now, since 1981, I must have worked on hundreds and hundreds of printed circuit boards and products um, all over the world in all different applications. And in every case, when people have used a solid knot ball plane, and use the other good EMC techniques, they got, um, uh, they haven't had any problems with their power integrity or signal integrity. They haven't had any problems with their EMI, generally passing their EMC tests on the first go. And they haven't had any problems with so-called ground loops either. It's a very powerful technique, not splitting a plane. And I recommend, I recommend that nobody ever splits a knot-ball plane again. <laughs> okay, it. we have another question from the audience. How are the microvias actually connected layer to layer? Well, I, I don't actually know, but I think uh, when I look at the Murata embedded capacitors, uh, the ones that are 150 microns thick, you find that they've got copper terminals on them, not, not tinned like you might expect, because of course you're not doing any soldering inside the board. So these embedded components rely on just being pressed together, you know, copper traces pressed against the copper terminals in the, the board stacker, and they're held together by the tension in the board. And I'm pretty sure that's what happens with microwires too, is that you just have a, a clean copper layer on on one uh, uh, build-up layer and a clean copper on the other layer, and when you glue the boards together, they just press against each other. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does, sort of. Yeah. <laughs> so I think they just press they just press copper to copper. Great, thank you. Uh, another question: How do you repair these microvias? Well. Uh, you need a microscope for a start. Um, other than that, I think it's just like re repairing any any via hole. You just have to be careful with your drilling when you when you drill about. Um, I don't recommend that anybody repairs um, any printed circuit boards anyway. Maybe prototypes or something if 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 you're in a hurry. I've never tried repairing a, a multi-layer board. I repair a two-layer board. I repair the outer layers, you know, but one of the problems is, um, and this is a, a wider issue really, people tend to use cheap, and I mean cheap, board manufacturers and cheap board assemblers, and then they use uh, bedded nails testing to find out where all the faults are, and then they repair them. The trouble is, uh, a repaired printed circuit board is a less reliable printed circuit board. So a lot of the repaired ones are going to come back as warranty returns. And warranty returns are something you want to avoid because each warranty return eats up the profit from between 10 and 100 uh, products that you've sold. So it's one of those things where um, because a lot of companies are departmentalized, so you have a production department, a manufacturing department who sends stuff outside to, to manufacture, you know, for board assembly. We have a bed of nails test department and a rework department and all the rest of it, uh, a lot of managers will say, oh, we've got to save money, so each department has to cut its costs. And what you end up with is the, the manufacturing division um, using cheap, nasty suppliers, so using uh, unreliable components and unreliable uh, assembly methods. Then you have to have all the bed of nails testing pads all over the thing, find the faults, and then somebody has to rework the boards so it actually costs the company more overall, never mind all the warranty returns, it costs the company more than using a more expensive uh, board manufacturer, a more expensive board assembler. I'm, I think, uh, this is a topic perhaps for another webinar, that 
that the best thing to do is to use more expensive board manufacturers, more expensive uh, component, sorry, board assemblers who use uh, proven good components. And then the few boards that don't work, uh, that don't actually function, you just throw away, or recycle, I should say. And I think most companies would find that uh, they can scrap their uh, in-circuit test department and save a lot of money there, and save money overall and have lower levels of warranty return. But very few people seem to look at the uh, technical economics, if you want to put it that way, of the whole organization. Um, they don't see that investing, spending more money in one place can save more money overall. Um, now, that may not be the question that they, the, the questioner asked. Uh, if you're just going to repair a microwire, it's just basically uh, a question of having a, a, a better microscope and, and maybe some uh, robotic tools so that you can drill things at very, with very fine precision without having to uh, try and hold the drill in my hand or something like that. But I think the, the question was a, had a wider, um, uh, brought up some wider issues about repairing boards. You don't want to be repairing boards that you're selling to people. You want them to be unrepaired, otherwise they're going to be more unreliable. And that's expensive. Great, thank you. If anybody has any more questions, you can email us at info at interferencetechnology.com. If you like our report, our webinars, join us this April, April 28 to 30, 2015, for EMC Live. This is an online multi-day event hosted by Interference Technology. It will feature roundtables, webinars, and panels on everything EMC related. Visit emclive2015.com for more information. A recording of this webinar will be available on our website, interferencetechnology.com. We'll send a link to all participants shortly. Thank you for attending. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Are we offline now?